Mrs. Kristalina, thank you so much for being on, the, the on our show, on Al Arabiya, once again. My first question to you is, you are present here in Saudi Arabia to open a representative office. Why does it make sense? What's the purpose behind uh, that? It is very important for the IMF to be close to our members. And this is uh, a regional office that would improve and speed up our engagement with all the GCC countries. To do three things. One, it is turbulent time. And policy advice that is calibrated to conditions in a country is really valuable. Time is of an essence. Two, we can increase training in the areas of strength of the IMF, from tax to public spending to digital money. Three, we can bring experience from elsewhere to the region, but also take experience of the region that has gone a long way in reforming itself to the rest of the world. Let's discuss now the global economic outlook. And I know that the report, the IMF's report on the global economic outlook will be issued shortly. Do we expect a revision downwards for the global economic outlook? We will see 2023 to be an even more difficult year than we anticipated. Why? Because inflation is stubborn. It has forced central banks into decisive action, and rightly so. But that increase of interest rates combined with a more expensive dollar makes the prospects for growth for many, many countries even darker. We will see countries in recession. I don't know how many. We will have to follow closely on developments. But even many countries that are not in recession, for people there, it would feel like a recession is hitting. We have pandemic, war, and now cost of living crisis. That combination is creating, on one side, people who are tired of all this. They're tired of the lockdowns. They are now horrified of the inflation pressures. And on the other side, it creates urgency for policymakers to act. My main message today, monetary policy tightening has to be complemented by responsible fiscal policy. We cannot have fiscal policy working against monetary policy by providing untargeted policy support. It has to go to the most vulnerable segments of society, the most vulnerable households. I, I use a very simple image. Imagine that monetary policy is putting a foot on the brake pedal. Fiscal policy at the same time is pressing the accelerator. That is a recipe for a very bad ride. Like what we have seen in the UK. It is, it is indeed in the UK we have seen that um, contradiction between monetary and fiscal policy. And the uh, authorities there, this is a very mature country with strong institutions, they are taking measures uh, to ensure that there is consistency. Uh, the Bank of England acted very appropriately, quickly. Uh, now there are changes in how the, the, uh, the package is going to be uh, pursued. And very important, the Office for Budget Responsibility is engaged to provide a valuable independent views. Mrs. Kristalina, however, some are viewing that certain big economies would enter uh, into a long and deep recession. What are your thoughts? So you talked about recession in certain areas uh, mm -hmm. around the world. Are we talking here about the big economies? Mm -hmm. What we are seeing is uh, a slowdown in China, significant slowdown and uh, recession fears in Europe, a more resilient U.S. economy where labor market is still quite tight. What is important to recognize is that interest rate increases in the U.S. have not reached its peak 
and therefore pressure on the economy and further slowdown of the, of the economy is to be expected. Are we going to see a prolonged period of slow growth or negative growth? I certainly hope no. What is working for the world today is after the global financial crisis, the banking sector was regulated. And today, the fear of financial crisis is much less. When the financial sector is functioning, it props up the economy so it functions uh, as well. What is concerning is this fragmentation we are witnessing in our world. Why does it matter? Because it makes it more difficult for harmonizing policy actions and it increases the cost of what we produce. So you're not seeing a re resemblance of the global financial crisis in 2008? In, in the global financial crisis, uh, we, we face a situation in which the financial sector collapsed. This is not in the cards today, although we should not take financial stability for granted. We are coming up with our financial stability report, and it would show that indicators of more stress in the financial system are starting to pop up. But we are not in a place where the balance sheets of banks are completely corroded and they can explode on us. How about the issue of sovereign debt, especially in emerging markets? You have uh, said previously that 25% mm -hmm. of emerging markets are already in sort of a debt uh, distress. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the worst, we have seen the worst or more uh, is coming, mm -hmm. especially with the devaluation of the currencies of these uh, countries? In, uh, um, in emerging markets that are already at or near debt distress, and as, as you uh, indicated, this is 25% of emerging markets, but especially in low-income countries where over 60% are in that situation, uh, the risk of uh, uh, debt distress turning into defaults and possibly putting us at risk of a uh, debt crisis is very real. This is why uh, we are going to have a discussion on, on this topic at the annual meetings of the IMF and, and the World Bank, and we are driving for more attention and early action uh, in countries, restructure debt early, don't wait. Look at maturities. If you need maturity extension, work towards it. We are uh, thinking of bringing private sector, official sector, creditors and debtors together so we can seek a pathway through this uh, risk. Let me, let me be very frank. We are at the time of high uncertainty and high risk of policy errors. This requires concentration, focus, so we don't suffer the consequences of self-inflicted injuries. Let's discuss the Arab countries, and let me begin with Egypt. We are hearing about delays in agreeing with Egypt on a new program. Is that true? Uh, we are working with Egypt uh, very <laughs> closely, and uh, we are seeing uh, actions now taken by the Egyptian authorities going in the direction that would make us coming with the program in, in the next, uh, m not months, but weeks. Uh, we see this as a possibility. Uh, where was uh, the uh, uh, most difficult uh, issue for us? Uh, Egypt has taken some steps uh, towards reducing the loss of reserves due to um, protecting their currency. These are welcome steps. We think that, that even more has to be done because there was a bleeding of reserves that puts Egypt in a difficult position. 
we are now at the point when we see more eye to eye, and therefore I am optimistic about prospects uh, for the program in the near future. So are you calling for a gradual depreciation of the currency, of the Egyptian currency, or do you think a one-time depreciation is more appropriate? We believe that uh, in this environment, uh, the world finds itself with the dollar shooting up, interest rates high. Uh, it is important that countries pursue flexibility of their exchange rate so they don't fall in a position of defending the indefendable. Uh, what we are also recognizing is that countries may need to use some protection measures. In other words, in the case of Egypt, we are very open to what buffer the country would put in place should it be necessary to protect the, the exchange rate, the domestic currency. But we are still in negotiations on what is the best framework uh, for it. Obviously, we have high appreciation for the complex dynamics uh, in, in Egypt. We don't want the Egyptian people to feel like they're robbed of their currency because it is depreciating and depreci depreciating even further. But we are advising strongly against melting your reserves for protecting mm. the currency when the depreciation is due to an exogenous external factor, not a policy lever you can use domestically to stop it. Are you asking Egypt for further removal of subsidies, and especially on bread, we actually which is a, a very controversial issue? We know that. We are very open uh, for Egypt to uh, protect its vulnerable people. We have been very supportive of strong safety nets and expanding these safety nets as more people are falling now uh, in uh, a situation of, uh, of food insecurity, of uh, uh, you know, poverty that 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 truly uh, uh, destroys communities. So we we do not want a subsidy removal for a, the sake of subsidy removal. We are, we do advise as much as you can. Try to avoid giving benefits to the wealthy people. Mm. They can live without those benefits. Concentrate your firing power to protect your most vulnerable populations. Mrs. Kristalina, let's discuss Lebanon. Do you see any hope of a revival of a program with the IMF? Hope never dies. We have a, a team on standby. We are ready any time to deploy this team if there is a political will in the country to undertake what has been agreed as prior actions. Remember, we reached a staff level agreement long time ago. We have agreed on what is necessary for the country, not for the fund, for the country to do. And unfortunately, these actions are yet to be uh, completed. So I met with the uh, Prime Minister of Lebanon and I told him what I would tell through you, the Lebanese people. We are eager to have a program to help the country. Please help us to help you. How about Tunis? What's the update on that? We have heard that the program uh, is between two to four billion uh, dollars. Mm. Uh, where, where does it stand right now? Uh, as for the size of the program, this is always agreed when the uh, negotiations are brought to, to completion. Uh, for progress on the program, uh, uh, very positive. We have a uh, uh, determined prime minister. We have a government that recognizes uh, what they need to do. And they have been pursuing what we have agreed uh, with remarkable conviction. It is their program. And I always have high hopes for countries where the program is for the benefit of the country, it is owned by the country. And this is why I'm uh, 
uh, optimistic about uh, progress uh, on Tunisia. Thank you so much. One last question, if I may, on the uh, GCC countries. Um, you, you have said that you expect the GCC countries uh, to have a 6.5 uh, growth in their economy this year, or, or is it next year? This year, this year, 2022. So how, how resilient do you think these economies are facing what's going on, mm. in the, on the global scene? Mm. Uh, the economies in the Gulf uh, have undertaken very significant reforms and uh, I congratulate them uh, for it. We also have seen significant progress in diversifying the economy. Uh, the non-oil sectors are growing uh, uh, quite uh, uh, consistently and uh, there are forces for good that are being unleashed. Take, for example, the power of women participation mm -hmm. in the economy. Uh, in Saudi Arabia today, the target set in Vision 2030 is already achieved and exceeded in terms of female participation in the labor force. And we see the same successes in, uh, in the Emirates. We see them uh, in uh, uh, the rest of the Gulf, uh, Qatar is making very significant strides in that direction. So young people getting jobs, women <laughs> contributing to the economy, these are engines of growth that have been kept idle and now are operating in full speed. But GCC economies are raising interest rates and Mm -hmm. th 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 we might see pressure, further pressure on oil prices due to weak demand given mm -hmm. the uh, global scene. So do you think that the GCC economies next year will be able to post significant growth compared to 2022? We are actually projecting uh, lower, relatively speaking, ro lower next to this year growth, 3.6% for 2023 both because we anticipate this slowdown in growth to reduce oil revenues, oil gas revenues, but also because uh, the recovery from COVID gave a boost uh, to the countries that is going to gradually recede. Where I see a very different Gulf region today is the commitment to avoid procyclical policies. Mm -hmm. Now there is a revenue boom. It is not being translated into salary increases, into hiring uh, people that are not necessary in the government sector. 